Good morning, or night, whichever the case may be, wherever you are today. This is Sharon Alexander with Arts with Alexander, and we are going to continue working on the mermaid's tail today. Get some adjustments. Hopefully we'll actually be able to see this a little bit better this time. I keep trying, eventually I'll get this right. So, we've got some details here on this little side fin. We have the wash across the entire background. Probably going to adjust a few of these bubbles depending on how they look against that background Because right now they just kind of in some cases look like holes in the picture But we've got this started over here, and I have I'm just gonna put it in the frame for a moment the set of mixed colors that I made by experiment And I think I'm gonna start with this uh, darker color down here. We're just gonna start over this purpley blue and wash our way up somewhere towards here. We're probably going to skip to this light, this slightly darker, brighter blue on the side. And then I've got this greenish teal to finish off the top. So let's see how far we get this time. I am going to use my number six squirrel hair today. I can always change it if I decide it needs to go bigger or smaller. And I'm missing the piece I use under my arm. Hmm. piece I use under my arm just so I don't smudge anything. Okay, back to the wash. And using that color, my note says that color was a ivory black and it should be medium yellow, but it's not. So, probably with cerulean. I apparently didn't do very good taking notes on that color. Nice looking color though. Might even be with ultramarine. It's hard to say at this point. But let's see how it looks. Get the uh, blotting paper out of the way. And see how this looks. Let's start over here. Oh yeah, that's going to be a lot darker and a little more gray than the tone we had before. A little bit more deep sea maybe, hopefully. Of course, you also have to remember that the color underneath this is also going to affect the color you put on top of it. These aren't acrylics, they're see-through. One of the advantages of acrylics is that you can paint them on top of other colors and not have any clue what colors underneath. Not so with watercolor. Watercolor is more like clear taking pieces of thin plastic and putting them on top of each other. Obviously they're not plastic. There's nothing plastic about watercolor. It's a very organic medium. And your results depend not only on your abilities, but also on the paint, and your paper, and your brush, and pretty much everything. Everything affects watercolor. Everything. There are even things you can drop into watercolor that will affect it. I know some people who add salt to their watercolor to give it different effects. And different sizes of salt will give you a different effect. Because the salt sucks up the water around it causing pigments to either be left behind or deposited in various ways. And the results are not always very predictable. Sometimes they're great and sometimes not so great. It really depends on the undependable. It's sort of like asking your toddler to do something. Maybe they'll do it. Maybe they'll complain. Maybe they'll say they will, and they never will. You come back two hours later, did you feed the cat? Uh, no? Well, no wonder the cat acts like it's starving to death. Oh, I forgot to tell you, it's out of food. I don't have any food to give it. Well, why didn't you tell me two days ago when you fed it? So that I could go get more. As the rabbit finds a noisy toy to play with. Yes, you. What have you got this time? Wire? Something wire? I probably should take that away from you. 
or you'll scare yourself with it and it might be a problem. I'm going to you at it. Hiding under the table. Oh, mommy, 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 it scared me, mommy. And the potential cat drama has shown up. Sitting in the doorway like, is the rabbit going to let me uh, hang out today or is she going to be fussy? Some days she's fussier than others about me being here. Purr, purr, purr. I'm going to be sure the rabbit has noticed it yet. Maybe she isn't here today since she's decided to go lay down in her chill spot underneath the actual desk. A little too much there. Let's get some water and thin that out. Another thing you can't do with plastic sheets and acrylic. Well, you can with acrylic. The results are just varied. Let's thin it out. All this rain has also created a fly problem, so I apologize if any of them decide to introduce themselves to the video today. Having to uh, pull out all the stops to remove them. Well, not all the stops. I'm not going to fly spray the place. Just not real big into having a bunch of chemicals in my house. I've enough problems already without adding chemicals to the mix. Especially since this house was a little over chemicalized before we got into it anyway. I prefer not to add any more if possible. Yeah, I, th I think this new color here is going to be an improvement. Let's see. I'm going to start seeing this washi, but I don't want it to be too dark. You know what? I bet this is actually a Payne's Gray mixture. It's behaving like Payne's Gray. Which is a very blue sort of gray. And that is what I'm seeing here. I think that may be what this is. This may be a lamp black and Payne's gray. If not, then it's awfully close. Let's just spread some of that water out because I'm going to want to do it. Like that color. What I'm not so sure about is this paper. It's nice thick paper, but it's pulp paper. The problem with pulp paper is that paint tends to just sit on it. It doesn't soak in, it doesn't spread out. Unless you get the paint next to the piece you're trying to do will wet and then the water instead of going into the paper goes on into the paint you've already done. A little irritating, a little hard to control. But it is what it is. I wanted to use this paper up and so using this paper up it is. I think this was some Strathmore 400. And I've been told by other people that Strathmore 400 is cotton paper. And this isn't cotton paper. This is definitely pulp paper. So I don't know where they find 400 that is in cotton, but if you guys know, let me know. Mostly to sate my curiosity. Because I'm actually preferring companies like Art and Fly. Art and Fly is nice really like the celluloid paper from Windsor & Newton. I also like Fluid 100, which is made in the USA for those people in the USA who are looking for something locally made. I believe it's made in Indiana. I'd have to actually pick the package to confirm that. But you know they always tell you shop local, and well, if you were looking for a local watercolor paper, there you go. It's at least made in the country. I have nothing wrong with French, German, or Italian papers. 
But if you're looking to do your country and you live in the United States, make 100 made here. They're made using the same methods as everybody else's papers. And they're not bad. Only thing I found about them that probably something to keep in mind is that they're a little soft. Not sure how else to describe that. So if you do a lot of like masking tapes especially, not so much with the fluids, but with masking tapes for your work, uh, maybe try something else. It doesn't work real well with the tapes. It tends to pull it up. And I don't mean just your paint. I don't mean just your paint. I mean the paper itself. It tears up really badly no matter what I do. If you're out there and you've got some trick I don't know for pulling up the tape from the fluid hundred paper, please share. I like the paper. I just don't use any sort of masking tape on it if I can help it. When I do, I just figure it's going to tear. Right there where that tape is. Yeah, we're just going through here and darkening up and shading up this area under here. Probably do it a little bit more shady the further under the tail we go because if we think about it, it's going to be shady under that tail. That tail is going through the light above it, through that water above it. And while it's already fairly shady down there as it is, that tail is going to block even more light. And I don't know why I always like to assume my light source is over here someplace, so this light is coming on this tail, and starting on this edge, it should, starting here, just get a little darker as it gets underneath that tail. And then I get up here, and it would lighten up again because, well, you're getting more light. That's how light works. It moves in a direction, and your shadows come from the direction that your light is and spread out from there. The further up it goes, the thinner it's going to be as far as your shadows. It's going to be more true to the size of whatever it's coming from. The further out it goes, the bigger it's going to get. If you have multiple light sources, you get multiple shadows. Isn't that fun? I know there was a big controversy over a popular at the time movie. Now there's a lot of controversy about the movie itself. Complaining that one of the main characters was just a little whiny kid. Who never grew up. Or grew out of his whininess. But the controversy was about the shadows in the poster. The planet in which he was being depicted had two stars. And some of the nerdier nerds complained that that meant there should have been two shadows. And so they made another poster of his regular shadow and the shadow of what he would become later. I guess to appease those guys. It didn't work, but they did it anyway. It looked pretty good. At least they couldn't complain about the shadows being wrong. Because the shadows were definitely right at that point. One shadow spreading out in each direction because the suns were on opposite ends of the poster. So, somebody did a pretty good job on the poster. After being told, hey dude, there's two suns. Oops. Oops. You better add some more shadows. Because two suns equals two shadows. Which of course makes you wonder, how many suns would it take to eliminate all shadows? Would you have to have one coming from every direction? Yeah, maybe there's an astrophysicist out there who will answer us. Who knows? That would be fun. Astrophysicist telling us how the shadows would work with more than two suns. I mean, one would assume if you went with logic that if there were three suns, there'd be three shadows. So how many suns would it take to eliminate all shadows? If you know how to calculate that and have fun with that, tell us what you come up with. Just for those of us who are curious. Always stay curious. Always keep learning. And never be afraid to just do something again. 
And what I mean by that, I mean like some of us go to Disney World every year. Certainly not me. I think I've been once in my life. But I know people who go to Disney World every single year. Well, okay, that's, that's cool. But if you've got the money to go there every year, why not go someplace different? Go to, I don't know, Monaco or Madrid. I'm sure it costs about the same money to fly as it does to stay in Disney World for a week. <coughs> Probably get cheaper hotels, too. Probably better food, although I don't know. There's supposed to be some pretty good restaurants in Disney World. That's what they tell me anyway. Pretty sure that 99.9% .9 of them were not there the last time I went. Seeing as I was five and, well, we're not going to talk about how long ago that was. If you know, you know. If you don't, you don't need to know. I mean, there's lots of places that would be cool to see. I've always thought you need to see New Zealand. I have talked to a few other artists from New Zealand and seen some of the things that they see in person there. Not to mention a couple of uh, favorite movies that were made there. Beautiful place. What do you like? Do you like beaches? They got them. Do you like mountains with snow on it? They got those too. Do you like beautiful flora and fauna? Oh my goodness, they have it in spades. Beautiful stuff over there. With none of the spiders and snakes that Australia has. <laughs> Those two places get so mixed up by people all the time because they have what some people would consider to be similar accents. I guarantee you, if you said that to an Australian, they'd be like, what are you talking about? They don't sound anything like us. Like comparing people from New York to anybody else in the United States. I mean, if you're paying attention in New York, you can actually figure out what area of New York they're from. The Bronx, Jersey. You do the same thing when you go to England. If you're paying attention, you can figure out which part of London they might be from. London proper, London Dockside. Maybe they're not from London. Maybe they're um, Welsh, Scottish. They all speak English, but if you know what you're listening for, you can pinpoint pretty close where those people grew up. Which is always fun. It's always fun to meet new people and say, hmm, where are you from? I'll never forget the first time I heard a South African accent. Oh boy, ladies, if you've never heard someone from South Africa talk, you think that a British accent is hot? Go oh, look up South Africa. Beautiful sound. I couldn't even really point out what the difference is compared to what I'm used to hearing, what it was that made it so different. There is a slight Germanic overtone to it, but also a musical sort of lilt. It's really hard to describe, but once you've heard it, it is beautiful. I imagine it's really great listening to them sing, too. Ooh, there's a thought. Maybe I should look up some South African music and see what that sounds like. Hmm. Well, I've listened to musicians from... Basically, around the world, I have heard African speakers sing. Usually, it's um, Tongan or Tamil, which is actually Indian. That's, that's not African. But I have heard some of them. I'm sure that everyone at some point has at least heard a sample of... Oh, gosh, my brain just went blank. There's a fairly popular artist down there. But I can't remember the name. It's Lady something. Lady something or other. And I know it's fairly popular, but I cannot think of her name at the moment. Oh well, if you do find out who it is, you can give her a listen. Like I said, she's pretty popular. Shouldn't be hard to find. Couldn't tell you what part of Africa she's from, though. But they do a lot of vocalizations. In fact, there's an entire musical genre down there that is nothing but vocals. 
And when you listen to it, you think, oh, wow, that's some beautiful music. I wonder what the instrument is. I'll tell you what the instrument is. It's voice. They didn't always have accents to, accents, access to musical instruments. Because anybody who owns musical instruments knows that they are not cheap. And when you live in a country where a banana a day is an entire week's worth of calories for them. Now, they look for alternative ways to do things. If that means that making your instruments out of your own voice is it, then there it is. They'll do it. And it is beautiful. Some people may remember Elton John and some of his music. He had one album where he actually hired a group of those singers and did several songs with them that were completely vocal. No instruments. Beautiful stuff. It was the same album that he had Diamonds on the Soles of Your Shoe of. Technically, I think we still have the cassette tape of that hanging around someplace. I think as a kid, I almost wore it out. We may have actually replaced it at least once. Nobody asked your opinion. If you don't like it, then don't listen to his music. Grab it. Over there into things she knows she shouldn't be into, getting into trouble again. <laughs> a little frisky. It's a good time for her, though, because it's starting to feel like fall. That's right, fall. And of course, with the drought we had this year, we have brown fallen leaves all over the place anyway. But actual fall is not far away. This is actually recording at the end of August, but I like to describe it as the oven's turned off. Sure, it's still warm out there. It's at least in the 80s, maybe low 90s now which for some places is probably not considered hot. It's really not here either because summertime, triple digits isn't unheard of. It certainly was the norm this summer. Right, Rabbit? Part of why she's in the house and not out of it. Rabbits are very sensitive to heat. Wouldn't want her to die of heat stroke. Not sure she didn't have a cousin who did this year. But it's starting to feel a little bit like fall. The oven's turned off. What do I mean by the oven's turned off? Well, for those of you who cook, you might experience that point where you've turned off the oven and then you reach in for the pie or the pizza or whatever it is you're cooking. And oh yeah, that, that oven is still hot. Still hot, don't touch the sides, don't touch the uh, grills inside there, don't touch any of that stuff, it'll burn you. But it's not on, not anymore. And you can kind of, I don't know, smell the metal cooling down maybe? Another one of those things that's hard to quantify and I know not everybody can smell that. But it's just a certain smell when everything's still on. It's still hot, but it's no longer producing heat. Maybe that would be the best way to describe it. No longer producing heat. Yep, too much. I just want to touch it, color. And it's just a lack of it continuing to heat up, I guess. Not sure. Like I said, that's another one of those hard to quantify things. Of course, I've changed blue, so it might also work for me if I go back to these bubbles after a little while and add some of this new blue. Sounds nice, doesn't it? The new blue. What are you working on today? I'm working on the new blue. Well, who's the new blue? I don't know, blue. Who's your new blue? <laughs> uh oh. Mr. 
cat thinks he's going to come hang out with me. He better be careful or he'll find out he's the new Ray. Because she is pretty particular about how far she'll let him come in. Whether she hasn't seen him or they've come to some truce that I don't know about. So if we hear a sudden noise and a crash, we'll know that she has noticed him. Being here so close. By the time she finally gets used to his presence, she'll probably go back outside again. I'm sure he'll come visit. You know I spooked. You come visit the rabbit, won't you? Let's see if she's attracted any critters that you want to eat. Hmm. Really dark over here, but there could be some shadow over there we don't know about. Off camera someplace. So let's start working on that next shard. Hmm. Donor chain. That's a pretty good sized place up there. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to go up a size. Draw off my brush. Pat it out. Pull it out. Just go ahead and shape those bristles. The natural bristles and oils from my finger will actually help condition them a little bit. So, moving up to the number eight, which is quite a bit bigger. This, I'm going to grab the other one, show you that there's actually quite a jump between six and eight. I haven't found a seven though, so I guess that's just the way it is. So yeah, I'm going to put that back in my nice little holder. Got a nice little brush holder over here that holds my brushes upside down. Thank you, I believe it was Walmart who provided that. Well, when I say provided, I bought it from them and they sent it to me, so. You know, they sort of provided it. But now I'm going to move on to that other blue, the slightly bluer blue. That makes a lot of sense. Brighter blue. I marked that out too, but I'm going to guess that that, well, it says ivory black. Both of these say ivory black, but I've marked out the yellow ochre, so obviously not yellow ochre. There is absolutely no telling what I mix this with. It's a nice blue, though. Look, it's very uh, cobalty looking. And for initial application, I want to be kind of cautious. I can always add more. It's a lot harder to take away color than it is to add it. Just like if you sew clothing, you'll know that it's a lot easier to take something in than it is to try to make it bigger. You notice I'm starting to bleed this down into that first color down there, and I think it's going to blend in pretty nice. I'm blending pretty nicely. It's really hard to tell where one color ends and where the next one begins, and that's what I want. I don't want to say, oh, oh, there's where the other color started. I can see that. No, I don't want that. I want to look at this and say, hmm, oh, hey, wait, there's another color here. Where did that one come from, and how did it get there? Blending. That is the purpose entirely of blending. To blend your paper from one end to the other, and not be able to tell where one color started and another color stopped. Just a nice, seamless blend. That's what I'm after. And be able to do that and say, nope, nope, I don't have any clue where that color started or that one stopped. Just a nice seamless blend, and it's sometimes trickier to get than you would hope. Sometimes it's workable and sometimes it is evasive. Trying to get that color to blend. Sort of like getting that soft edge when you're putting a color down and then just Fanning it out, like right here, if I just walk away right now, we would see this edge. It's a pale blue edge. 
But if I left it there, walked away, let it dry, and came back and tried to fix it and make it blend into the upper, get it? You'll be able to tell for the rest of eternity, or at least until the paper rots, where that color came from and where it went to. It's a little bit juicy here. We've got a little bit of bubbling because this is a larger area, and that's okay. This is another reason why we put just a little bit down first so that it's got the ability to do that. And my brush is a little bit too wet. Pat some of that off and get a little bit more pigment. Okay, maybe just a little bit more pigment. There we go. Because I need to darken this area slightly and I want this color on it. Now I might have a little too much more color, so we'll just pat it off again. Not a big deal. And blending the color into that little piece that was down there. There we go. And there's a certain part where I really don't even have to add it down, like down here. You can hardly even tell that's a different color. But as we work up higher, we'll notice that this is a lot bluer. And this is a lot grayer. It's finding that little mix between the two that will really, really make that color shine and give that effect of it just gradually darkening up as it goes down towards the ocean floor. Which is what we want. We want that gradual change from that darker, less sunlight world into the dark depths below. Those dark depths that you just can't see what's down there. What's down there? Let your imagination wander because that's what we did when we said we we're going to paint this mermaid. What's down there? The unknown. I know that there's an entire sort of book and based on that, they call it horror. And it's supposed to be scary. Watch well, slasher flicks and monster movies. Yeah, those can be kind of scary. But just the unknown. It's scary because you don't know about it. Well, I guess that scares some people. I tend to find that sort of thing just kind of boring. The unknown doesn't scare me. Good old jump scare. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm going to jump out of my seat like everybody else. But just the unknown. If I did that, I'd be scared of everything. There is so much out there unknown. There is only a tiny fraction. I think it was 6% of our ocean that's ever been explored. Beyond just, you know, the surface. As in, yep, this surface spreads from Africa to South America and everywhere in between. Well, that's not much exploration, is it, considering that the ocean's got depth? There are places in the ocean that are miles deep and there are creatures down there that have either never been seen before or only barely glimpsed by some intrepid scientist who has gone down to the very depths of the ocean looking expensive and while the idea of finding a potential sea monster doesn't scare me at all the idea of having that ship crack while i'm down there looking around well, let's just say there's a good reason why i'm not a marine biologist and i will just enjoy other people's videos and pictures of the deep sea I'll admit, I am fascinated and love the deep sea. I also am fascinated by and love the jungle. I also know just enough about the jungle to know that I don't know anything about the jungle and I don't want to go there. Unless it's a guided tour with lots of really big guns and a lot of antiseptics and antifungals and insecticide. <laughs> and, and, and probably some way to... Um, deter snakes. I'm sure there must be some way to deter snakes and, and other things like leeches and I'm just, I'm just going to stop talking now. I'm starting to creep myself out. 
the things that I know perfectly well. Because we have bugs and things. I'm not real happy when a grasshopper jumps out and lands on my hand. It's a momentary jump scare and a slight freak out, even though I happen to like insects. Most of them, anyway. And granted, if you show me a roach, I'll show you a shoe. But I think that would be most people. The regular things, though, like your spiders and flying insects. No, it's not a big deal. I'm only bothered by mosquitoes because they bite me. <laughs> Things that are perfectly well known. We all know that spiders and mosquitoes can bite. Knowing your area, ooh, it's going to be pretty dark, although I kind of did want to darken it. Knowing your area and knowing your insects and your snakes is a good thing. Because for people that are scared of the unknown, the best way to combat that is to understand it better. There's probably people who are afraid of bats because they've heard that bats have rabies. It's true. Bats can have rabies. But so can that dog sitting on your couch looking your face. I don't see very many people freaking out about the idea that dogs could have rabies. But bats are different. They're different. They're, yeah, I don't, I don't like bats. They're creepy. I don't know. I've seen a few bats up close and personal. Usually I'm just afraid I'm going to hurt them. Because to me they just look fragile. I was afraid that I would step on one if it was on the ground and just crush the life out of it, stepping on it. And I would be very upset because I actually really, really like bats. To me, cutes, bats are just cute. I wouldn't call them cuddly, but they are cute. At least as much so as most dogs. Notice I said most dogs, because there are some pretty ugly dogs out there. And I'm not going to name any breeds because I'm sure somebody would get upset and say, oh, but those are so cute. They're so cute, they're ugly. Yep, I've heard those before. I could say the same thing about kitty cats. Man has done some horrific things with the genetic codes of animals simply for the sake that they think it looks cool. Hey, look at that flat nose. No, he can't breathe, but who cares? He looks cool. Dogs, cats, horses, pretty much anything mankind has domesticated. I, I sometimes think victimized has usually come across this problem that they come up with some breed that they think is so cool and they breed this feature and breed this feature and breed this feature until the animal itself is so inbred and they ignore other problems caused by these breeded features. There's at least one particular breed in my head right now that I'm thinking of I believe it was a bulldog that is so inbred at this point that they no longer consider it a normal dog breed. The bloodline is so narrow and fraught with so many problems that they no longer consider it a normal dog breed. Kind of sad when you think about it. For sure we all love our poochies, and some of us may have bulldogs, but to think that that bulldog is no longer considered a normal breed because it's just so inbred and has so many problems. And we did this. Mankind did this. Yeah. I mean, people can talk about pollution, and pollution's bad, 
people can talk about deforestation. Deforestation is bad. But how much less so than using our ability to alter the very species around us and change them so much that not only are they no longer the same thing that they started out as, no longer are they the wolves that they bred into dogs, and there's some debate about that, but they are also no longer even considered dogs. I mean, not true dogs. They're considered some sort of strange mutation at this point because they've just got so much changed. It's not uncommon for certain breeds to have ear infections because of long, floppy ears that have been bred into their species. It's not uncommon for most of the dogs with the flattened faces to basically breathe out of their mouth because they can't breathe out of their noses anymore. Cats do the same thing. Those adorably ugly Persian cats people like, same, same thing. They're a little less inbred, maybe just because there's so many more of them. And so many people have bred them, I guess. That they have a little bit more of a, a reach in their bloodlines, but it's not uncommon for those cats to have no sense of smell and to not even be able to breathe through their noses anymore. They have terrible asthma. All sorts of, of breathing problems because of the genetics that they were handed by mankind. Well, that's getting depressing. Let's go back into the ocean. So, let's, what's uh, a fun topic about oceans? How about sea turtles? Sea turtles are cool. I was watching a documentary with one of my kids this morning about sea turtles. It's not always a really undepressing subject either when you consider how few of them make it to the ocean and how many of them are hatched compared to how many of them make it to the ocean. But turtles are really fascinating creatures. Sea turtles in particular spend almost their entire lives after they hatch and make it to the ocean in the ocean. Some of them eat jellyfish, some of them eat sea kelp, they eat a variety of different things, some of them eat fish. And these guys spend most of their lives in the water. When you think of all the hazards they go through, they're even hazardous to each other, during the breeding season at least. Because it's entirely possible for over-happy males to drown the female that they're trying to mate with. Well, they got dark fast. But what struck me about them, really, aside from how easy it is for them to die, was the patterns on their shells. Because they are really spectacular. The ones we were watching to start with, I believe, were called Ridley's Turtles. And they were basically just kind of little dark sea turtles. And then they moved on to the greens. I have to admit, I probably like the greens more than most of them. Because if you get one of those turtles on land, they really don't look special. Most sea turtles look kind of blah on land. And not just because they're slow on the land, but because they just, when they dry out, they don't look like much. They're pretty scraped up, and the colors dull out when they're not wet, but when you get them wet again, beautiful sunburst patterns of yellows and greens and browns. I'm sure most people have seen something that was quote-unquote tortoise-shelled. Once upon a time, and part of the multiple reasons why we have endangered species of sea turtles, is because people would harvest them, or hunt them, depending on how they did it, for those shells. I 
I've seen a couple of examples of genuine tortoise shell glasses. They're beautiful and fragile because they're natural materials, even more so than lucemite. But the patterns that you see there are already in the shells. All they do is shape them, polish them, and put them in a display. And the entire shell is like that. Each and every little section has these colors. And you don't normally see this because usually when you see them, it's videos of them laying their eggs on the shore. Stab me with your toe, silly rabbit. And they're all dried out and a little bit scuffed and covered in sand. And you don't see just how beautiful these creatures are. Most people think once they get to the ocean, their troubles are over. Sea turtles, their life has begun. Grow up, find a mate, make lots of eggs, your troubles are done. Not that simple. <coughs> there are a lot of fish in the ocean, and some of them like turtles. And we're not even going to touch on mankind, but they're turtle soup. Oh, wait, we just did. And that's all I'm going to say. You don't know about that, and you want to look for a couple of hours of depressing information, knock yourself out. Do my terrible Bronx impression, knock yourself out. Or I'll do it for you. Obviously, I am not Bebox. Who would identify it much better than I would mimic it? <laughs> if you're from the Bronx and you want to tell me how terrible my accent is, knock yourself out. I won't mind. I'll only be slightly offended and I'll laugh at myself. For even making the attempt. a little drink here. And you're probably thinking, man, this sure does take a long time. It does. Anytime you want to know why you go someplace where somebody's selling actual art, not just a print from China in a cheap plastic frame, something to consider is the amount of time it takes for an artist who's making something beautiful for you and everyone else to enjoy. It takes time. I know that one of my most popular pieces took me a month. I had all these beautiful colored gemstone pebbles. Bright, bright, beautiful koi fish underneath these pretty lilies which I felt pretty good about because they looked very 3D in their appearance. And yet also very artful because the paints themselves were highly granulated. Especially on the flowers. And it is still probably one of my most popular pieces. I know that on my Deviant Art, it still holds the record for the most likes. As far as my work goes. I'm sure there are other people that have far more likes, but they also probably make money on their art. Okay, so now I'm going to try to move up here without leaning and laying on my picture. Because I just want a little hint of that blue here to start. That I can blend into it. Just a little bit of that blue so that when I come back in with the teal, there'll be just enough of it to blend into. 
and not look like I just suddenly stopped the color. Less than that. <laughs> Hard to find that happy medium sometimes. Which reminds me, I'm enjoying this music. I hope you are too. Uh, let's bring this out. I guess the company that's putting this out is just called Vlog. I assume it's for people who do vlogging. But I like to pick these sort of things because they give you exactly one hour of music. I can't think of a better timer. At the end of an hour, I can hear the music stop or it'll start a commercial and then I can say, oh, our hour is over. Time to stop afflicting you with me doing art. Although, I really hope you are enjoying it. My art, just not just the music. I hope you're enjoying the music too, honestly. I'm sure those people that made the music that they're allowing me to use for free worked very, very hard on that. I'm not sure what musicians go for by the hour. I have actually had professional artists suggest that I should do my artwork at $20 an hour. Uh, maybe for an established artist that works. To be honest, I've been posting mine at minimum wage. And some professional out there is probably outraged to hear that, but since I'm not actually selling anything anyway, because nobody's bought anything in a long time, I guess I'm not killing anybody with my prices. <laughs> All right, I think at this edge, I'm going to move that paint up here, partially because it's sitting where my elbow needs to. And you probably notice I've got a lot of water in here. I've also got a lot of paint on the edges of my little up there. And I am wiping a lot of pigment and a lot of water and a lot of paint off on the edges, partially to wash off some of that extra paint. And it's a little shadier here. There would be a little bit of more shade here because of the tail coming this way. Probably going to have to have multiple layers to build up our color, but that's part of what watercolor is all about. So why don't you just stick it all on there at once and get it over with? Because if I stick it all on there and get it over with at once, it'll look like I'm using poster paint that's got chalk in it. That's not pretty. Part of what makes watercolor pretty is all those layers. One color on top of another color, maybe it's just layers of the same color. But the more layers you put on, the darker and more bright it becomes, the more saturated it becomes, and the more it will pop at you when you look at it in a canvas or in a frame since, you know, it's paper most of the time. Although there are ways to paint on canvas. Maybe we'll do that someday just so we can show you. I know that somewhere around here I have a piece of clay board. I'm not sure that's what they, oops, too much. I'm not sure that's what they call it anymore, but the first time I heard of it, it was basically clay board. Too wet. And basically it's a, a clay mixture. Not unlike the stuff that ladies put on their faces. You know, kaolin clays. And they applied it to a board, an art board, as a surface for painting. Now, I have not tried this yet. I am told it is very different in behavior from paper, just flat paper. 
So I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous about using it. The last person I witnessed using this said that it was very easy to lift your color back up off of it by accident. Basically, go over it once, probably not a good medium to go over multiple times. So, I'm probably going to have to choose something pretty simple and fast and loose to put on it. I'll have to think about what I put on it pretty hard because most of my preferred art is not unlike what I'm doing here with multiple components and multiple layers. I'm not usually a fast and loose person when it comes to my art. Right, some people are saying, well, why are you doing watercolor? It's supposed to be fast and loose. Well, there's, there's more than one way to do everything. Everything. You can say there's only one way to play basketball, but that's only because they're your rules. Other places have other rules. You can look at the way the Incans played basketball. Yeah, that's right. The Incans had a form of basketball. I don't remember what it was called, but I don't think you'd want to play it by the same rules that we play our basketball here today. Because their ball was a solid block. I don't remember if it was wood, clay, or whatever it was, but it was not. <laughs> Something you wanted to hit with your hand very hard, or at least it didn't sound like it to me. I first heard this and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. How were they playing this? But they had a stone basket, a goal, if you will. And the goal was to get that ball in that hoop for the glory of the gods. At least that's what everyone says. Maybe they did it just for fun, who knows, but it was supposedly for the glory of their gods. I was like, I don't know, that sounds pretty painful to me. I think I'd rather be sacrificed on the hill with everybody else. <laughs> because hitting that hard ball of theirs does not look like fun at all. It looked like a good way to break your hand. To each their own. I'm sure that I'm not alone in saying that I think pretty much the same thing every time I watch people play contact sports of any kind. It doesn't look like fun to me. It looks painful. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Uh, how's the broken rib? Oh, it wasn't a rib. It was your clavicle. Mm, sorry, dude. Oh, it's that. That was so funny. Do it again, huh? Okay, you go right ahead. I guess I imagine such things are probably absolute terrors to somebody like a musician, flutist, celloist, or somebody that uses their hands to do music because you tear up a musician's hand and they're done for. Unless they can write music. And then they've got a career of writing music ahead of them. How thrilling. Yeah, definitely some more of this blue. I think I'm too blue. Wipe some of that blue off. Little, little man of the world. Everything he saw was blue. Which is funny because when I see the ocean, I very rarely actually see the color blue. I mean, there's some pictures of the Bahamas, and I'm told those are real pictures of the colors of the Bahamas, and they look really, really turquoise and blue. But to be honest, I see lakes, rivers, oceans, and they look awfully green to me. Or brown. And a lot of the local places that aren't as um, aerated. Look awfully brown to me. Especially if it's been raining heavily lately. 
and get all that dirt and sediment washed into the water. As much as we like to think we drink clean water, at least a small portion of that, regardless of how hard they clean it, ends up in our drinking water. Maybe it's not a bad amount, and I'm sure they've sanitized it like crazy. They better have since the list of uh, chemicals in our local water that they add to it in order to sanitize it is at least 20 long, maybe more. Makes me wish that we had European water where they just tell you, hey, the tap water's dirty, boil it, period. <laughs> they don't condition a lot of European waters. It's just water and what's in it is your problem if you don't boil it. Which is probably why they drink so much tea. I know it's why there are certain countries that start drinking wine, at least in a diluted form, extremely early. The idea of not being able to buy wine at a, or beer at a bar at, until you're 21 is just laughable to some places. There's at least a couple of places I know of where you walk into a bar at 14 and buy a beer. Dream come true for some of my neighbors, I'm sure. And to be honest, for the number of people that will go and buy their friends under age beer, I'm not really sure that the law is actually helping anybody. They just look for sneakier ways to get it. Like anything else, it's kind of a catch-22. It's like trying to regulate this to make it better, make it less accessible, and yet at the same time, they're going to find ways to get it if they really want it. The prohibition. They told everybody no more alcohol, so when they do, they start making their own. Which doesn't sound like a big deal until you realize that some of the moonshiners were using things like lead pipe. If you go to other places where they uh, needed a cheaper fix, if you will, say like London. There was a certain area and a certain time of London where gin could be extremely dangerous because it was made of turpentine. Yeah, that's right, turpentine. Personally, I can't imagine wanting to drink something that tastes like turpentine. Just the smell of it's enough. But they were so desperate for their own drinks, they were making it with turpentine. And nobody even knows what was in it since anymore, but one of the more infamous things it had in it was wormwood. There are some places and people that will use wormwood for various medical reasons, or at least supposedly medical reasons. But wormwood is rather toxic and can be dangerous if you uh, don't know what you're doing. And I'm going to bet some of the people making absinthe, they were a little loose with their ingredients. Considering the story which launched its actual banishment from our country. The most popular one cited was of a man who supposedly, after drinking some absinthe in his barn, came in the house and murdered his wife. They attributed it to the drink, and supposedly that's what started the whole thing of having absinthe banned. I doubt that it was really just one incident. There had to have been more, but like the drink itself, which is basically impossible to get anymore because nobody knows what it was actually made out of anymore other than just a few guesses and hints. I mean, they know that it got its color from Sente. But they really don't know what else was in it, and a lot of historians have guessed that part of the reason for that is it depended on who was making it. Because it was basically an herbal tonic. Which means that it was supposedly for their health, and sort of like saying tea. 
Okay, you can say T. It's T. Anybody around here is going to think of Lipton's or one of those other popular tea companies. But in all truth, if you really get into tea, tea is an herbal concoction and can be made out of just about everything. There are teas out there that have absolutely nothing to do with the tea leaf, which started the American Revolution in theory. It didn't really. It was politics, of course, but they used tea as an excuse and the price of tea. Uh-oh. And that was our hour. We may have to finish this up next time. Well, I guess that's as good a place to stop as any. So, I'm going to wish everybody a great day. I hope everybody's enjoyed this. If you have enjoyed this, please like, subscribe, ring the bell, all that good stuff. I mean, share it with your friends so that they can see it too. And we will hopefully finish this next time. Unless I come up with some more details to add to it later. So, for now, this is Sharon Alexander with Arts with Alexander, and goodbye!